Tonight we come to another one of the compound names of God, uh, one of the least used in the scripture. In fact, it's only found one time in the scripture, and that's Jehovah Jireh. But it happens to be one of my favorite names for God. It was actually a name that Abraham used of a place that related to God, but through the centuries it has become connected with the character of God. The word Jehovah Jireh means Jehovah provides. Uh, technically, the word provide is the word prevision. It, it comes from prevision to see the need, the, the need before, and therefore being able to supply the need. Therefore, Jireh means that the God who sees is also the God who provides the need. Let's look at the story as it unfolded in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. And it came to pass after these things that God tested Abram, uh, Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here am I. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. He split the wood and he went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and the lad. The lad and I will go yonder, worship, and we will come back again to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to his father and said to him, Father, he said, Here am I, son. He said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham, Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Father, there's more to the story that we'll be looking at tonight, but we'll stop right there and give you thanks and praise for this part of the story and for what we can learn from this story about your provision in our lives, just as you provided for Abraham and for Isaac. Guide us, direct us, and help us to unpack all the truths, all the treasures in your word this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In this passage, we see the command. The command that came from God. The command was direct. God said, take your son, your only son, in verse 2. This was the only son God recognized. Now, if you know anything about the story of Abraham, you know that he'd already had one son 13 years earlier, named him Ishmael. This was the son of uh, his wife's handmaid, Hagar. This was not the son of promise. This was the son of, God, of, Ab of Sarah trying to help God along in the promise and trying to fulfill the promise that God had given to Abraham when it wasn't God's intention at all. And God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, that you love. And there's a lot of controversy today in the world regarding two groups of people, both claiming Abraham as their... Uh, progenitor as, as the head of their family, as it were, their ancestry, but both claiming different sons, one claiming their lineage through Ishmael and the other one through Isaac. We know, of course, the Jews are the ones who claim their heritage through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the lineage that God recognizes. That is the only lineage that God recognizes. Because he said here in chapter 22, take your son, your only son, the son of promise. In Genesis chapter 17, he said to Sarah and Abraham, I will bless her, Sarah, and give her a son by you. And you'll call his name Isaac. This was the son of promise. But this was a difficult command for Abraham, as it would be a difficult command for any of us. To take your son, your only son, the son of promise. Now, Abraham was 100 years old when, it, when Isaac was born. Now he's probably 113 to 115 years old. 
uh, Isaac was a young man. He was able to carry the wood uh, up the mountain for the sacrifice. This is difficult. It's difficult any time we would be asked to do this. And it seems like God is saying it's okay to have human sacrifice. God wasn't saying that at all. And we'll find that as we unpack the uh, treasures here. But it was a difficult assignment for him. It was an assignment with no return and no escape. It was not going up to the altar and pricking Isaac's finger and dropping a little bit of blood on the altar. It was not even making a slash that would hurt for a little bit, but could be the bleeding stopped and restored, the son restored. This was a complete sacrifice. When they offered a burnt sacrifice, first of all, they would slit the throat of the lamb that was being sacrificed. In this case, Abraham would be required to slit the throat of his son, his only son, Isaac, whom he loved. Next, he would place that sacrifice on a altar with wood under it, light a fire, and that sacrifice would be consumed. There was no return. So when Abraham said to his servants, the lad and I will return, in verse uh, 5, we will come back, he was expressing faith. And over in Hebrews, we see that he did have that faith when he said that uh, he realized that God could raise him back up if he so desired, that God was in control and he was giving his heart and his life to God. Sometimes you and I are faced with some difficult situations as well. We're faced with some dilemmas that require a uh, difficult task for us. And, and sometimes we reject it. We say, no, God, no, Lord, I'm not going to do that because it's too difficult. God will never ask us to do anything that he will not give us the strength and the ability to accomplish. There may be some things we are called upon to give up in our lives that are hard for us, things that we enjoy, but they are sinful. They are against God's plan and God's purpose. God will never ask us to go any place or do anything that he'll not give us grace and ability to accomplish. There have been a lot of people that have given up their homes, their livelihoods here in America and gone to foreign countries. I believe it was Jim Elliott who said he is no fool who uh, gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He understood that what we give up here is minuscule in response to what God is going to give if we follow his commands. And so we see the command to take your son, your only son, and offer him as a burnt sacrifice to Jehovah. The second thing we see in this story is the compliance of Abraham. And we see that in verse 3. Abraham rose early the next day. He didn't wait a week. He didn't think about it. He didn't contemplate. He didn't say, well, let's wait for a more convenient time. Let's wait for better weather, for this or that or the other. He didn't argue with God. He didn't try to bargain with God. He just got up the next morning, saddled his uh, donkeys, and split the wood and went on his journey. He rose up early without argument is the first thing we need to see in the obedience and the compliance of Abraham. When God tells us to do something, then we need to respond with immediate obedience and compliance to his will for our lives. The second thing we see here is that Abraham made whatever provisions he needed to make. He knew that there, was not, there were no convenience stores along the way that he could stop and buy supplies. There were no trees necessarily in that area where he could, was going to uh, cut down and provide the wood. So he had to provide the wood, the fire, everything that he needed for this sacrifice. He had to gather a couple of his servants to go and help him because it was going to be a, multi, excuse me, a multiple day journey to that place. A, a multiple days, it turned out to be three days. He knew the general location, even though he didn't know the exact mountain, because God said, I'll show you the mountain that you're to uh, sacrifice him on. But he knew the general location. He knew it would take about three days to get there. So he had to have the provisions to eat and all of the other things that were necessary along the way to service to help him in this process. So he gathered all of those things together. And in verse 4, 
he went three days journey until his eyes came upon the place that God was going to make the sacrifice. Now in this process, we see also a prophetic announcement. It's one of my most favorite uh, prophetic announcements that I came across, and it, it was several years, I have to admit, before this actually hit me. But in verse uh, 7, Isaac makes a profound statement. Now Isaac's a young man, probably some have said 13 to 15 years of age, and he's going up the mountain. He has seen his father make multiple sacrifices year after year, day after day, uh, to God. And so he says to his father, Father, here's the wood. I'm carrying the wood. You've got the fire. But haven't we forgotten something? Uh, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb that we're going to be sacrificed? And Abram said to Isaac, God will provide for himself a lamb. Now, the King James puts it, God will provide himself a lamb. Both translations, the New King James and the King James Version, are correct. Because God did provide himself a lamb. In this particular case, in verse 13, we find that God provided a ram. God, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket. And God said, take the ram and slay it, and offer it as a sacrifice. God provided a ram for Isaac. He provided a lamb for the world. John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He pointed to Jesus as he was coming towards him and noted that he was the Lamb of God who was to take away the sin of the world. God provided for Isaac a ram. For the world, he provided a lamb. The New Testament uses the same kind of idea in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, when, it said, when Paul says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. He doesn't supply all of our wants, but he supplies our needs. That same Jehovah Jireh that was seen in Genesis is seen in the New Testament as the God who supplies our needs, who sees what our needs are, and who provides those needs. Now, when we see what God has done for us, there is the conclusion of the matter. The conclusion of the matter is simply this. God intervened. In verses 11 and 12, it's God says, as Abraham is bringing the knife down on his son, a lot of times we don't think about Isaac, but here Isaac has been a willing substitute, a willing sacrifice, as it were. God wants willing sacrifices, and, and Paul talks about that we present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Uh, Isaac was doing that because he willingly succumbed to his father. He allowed his father to bind his hands and his feet, perhaps, and put him on the altar. Now, Isaac was certainly strong enough that he could have fought against his father and resisted, but he didn't. He lay there trusting God as much as Abraham was trusting God. And Abraham rose in his hand that knife, ready to come down and slit the throat of his son to make the sacrifice. And as he was coming down, God said, stop. And he stopped. God said, behold, there's a ram caught in the thicket. And did God change his mind? Well, what was God thinking? God didn't change his mind. God had on his heart and in his mind the whole time a test for Abraham. And the King James uses the word tempt. God tempts no man. The word tempt there is actually the word that is used for a test. God was testing the heart and the obedience of Abraham. It's the same idea as a physician taking a test before the medical board to prove 
that he is qualified to receive his license as a doctor or a lawyer to take the lawyer's exam to prove that he understands the law well enough to practice law. It is that testing of our abilities, of our times, of whatever we need to prove that we are able to carry out the responsibility that has been given to us. God gave Abraham a test. And Abraham passed with flying colors. You see, God wasn't interested in a dead sacrifice. A dead sacrifice meant nothing to him. A surrendered heart meant everything to him. And so God saw when Abraham went to slay his son, went to carry out every detail of the commandment that God had given to him in verses 1 and 2, God knew that he had the surrendered heart of Abraham. And so he said, stop. There's a lamb or a ram in the thicket. And Abraham said to God in that place in verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mouth of the Lord, it shall be provided. Abraham recognized that whatever the need was, God would take care of it. God would meet the need. Has there been a need in your life? Is he your Jehovah Jireh? He wants to be. I said at the outset of this Bible study that this is one of my favorite names for God. And I suppose it's my fa one of my favorite names for God because I have seen it in action so many times. I could spend a long amount of time going through all of the ways, and, and I'm sure I've missed some uh, even in that, the ways that stand out in my mind that God provided for me when I could see no other way. When I could see no way out of the situation, God opened the door. Yeah, sometimes it was a financial door that he opened. Sometimes I had bills that came due and I had no idea where I was going to get the money from. I'd go to the mailbox and I'd open up a letter and perhaps somebody had given me an honorarium, or honorarium for doing a funeral. And it was just enough to take care of the bill. Or maybe it was a gift. Or maybe it was some money that I found that I didn't realize that I had tucked away somewhere. It could have been any number of things. There are many blessings that God has given to me through my life. And if you're honest with yourself and you think about the blessings of God, you will find that God has met needs before sometimes you even knew you had a need. The God who pre-sees always provides. So I wonder if he is your Jehovah Jireh tonight. He's willing and he's able to provide for your every need if you're willing to call on him and surrender to his lordship in your life. Will you make him your Jehovah Jireh tonight? Pray with you. Father, we thank you for your leadership, your direction, and most of all for your provision, for the fact that you see what our needs are and you provide for us, regardless of what those needs are. So help us just to rely on you. Help us to trust you regardless of what our situation is, regardless of what our needs are to realize that you are Jehovah Jireh. You see what our needs are and you will provide. Father, if there's one out there that's listening tonight or that's listening in the future and has never come to that saving relationship with you that's real and personal, may they tonight fall on their face before you and acknowledge that they are sinners and, a sinner and say, oh God, I know that I'm a sinner. I failed you in so many ways. But I know that Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sin. And so right now, I ask you to save me. Give me your eternal life. Take control of my heart and life and use me for your glory now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We trust that these messages have been 
a blessing to you, and we'd like to hear from you. You can send us an email at uh, Pastor Bob at RBCH. That would come directly to me. Or if you prefer to use postal service, you can write us at uh, Riverside Baptist Church, 1568 East Harden Street in Graham, North Carolina. Perhaps you'd like to know a little bit more about Riverside Baptist Church. You can go online and find us at rbch.org. And, of course, we'd love to have you come and worship with us at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Uh, here in our sanctuary, we have reopened our Sunday school at 9 o'clock for children, youth, and adults. And so we would encourage you to come and join with us at any time you have an opportunity. We'd love to see you. So until next time, God bless you.